We've worked hard and made history many times. We've gotten this far because together we are tireless. That doesn't mean we don't get tired. It means we help each other continue on. And knowing one voice is strong, but the power of thousands or millions is stronger. We are the tireless, and together we will achieve gender equality. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reads to Challenge Gender-Based Violence. We are going to be speaking with advocate and author Julie Esselond. My name is Andrea, and I work with the Canadian Women's Foundation. As you may know, we are Canada's public foundation for gender equality, and we support diverse women, girls, and everyone impacted by gender inequity to move out of poverty, out of violence, and into confidence and leadership. So right now, we are in the midst of an Act Together campaign in partnership with The Body Shop. It's really focused on the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. We're trying to rally some support and some awareness and get people doing something each of these 16 days. We started, if you had joined us, we started on November the 25th and we're going to run until December the 10th. And these are actions that you can do every day. And some things that people have already been doing have been setting up digital events, signing the National Action Plan letter to go to your representatives to say you support this. We've had people share the signal for help and we're going to go to that a little bit um, in a little bit just to share what this signal for help is all about. We also um, have some things coming up. We have critical thinking cards that we're hoping people will use to start some discussions with their family and friends on issues of gender-based violence. We're also wanting to share a memorial video on December the 6th, really focusing on the Montreal massacre and what those lessons that we learned from that will be to take us forward in the future. And of course, our podcast, we just uh, launched a new season of our podcast, All Right Now What?, trying to get speaking on the issues of gender-based violence. One of the things that is really, really apparent to me, I think over the last little while is that people actually don't know very much about gender-based violence. Many people don't even know what the term is. They haven't seen it, they don't understand it. So of course there's lots of myths and misunderstandings that we have to address. Um, so I think that this is a great opportunity, something simple that you can do every day. They're digital actions, and we have up until the de December the 10th to do something about it. So I'd really encourage you to go to our website, canadianwomen.org, to find out more information about how you can get involved. So part of the activities that we're doing is speaking with our friend at the foundation, Julie Lalonde. She's a really wonderful person that we'd love for you to meet. And she's just been such a voice in this conversation of addressing gender-based violence. Now, I want to get into some housekeeping before we get started. First of all, I really want to impress upon you that we're going to be speaking on some difficult issues on gender-based violence. And we're also going to be showing a little video with depictions of stalking. So I want to encourage you to please exercise self-care and take a break if you're needed. Um, I just really want you to make sure that you take care of yourself all along the way. And if you need to take a break and come back to this, feel free to do that. This will be available on our Facebook page. It's going to be available on our YouTube channel as well, too. You can always take it in bits um, and do what you need to do. And if we get cut off along the way, sometimes technology is not our friend. Just hang tight. We're going to come right back on. And if you see any links that you don't recognize, I want to tell you, do not click on those links. People do some sketchy things on Facebook sometimes, and we don't want you to get into anything that uh, you are not wanting to get into and get into any websites that you're not ready to get into. So I would just encourage you, don't click on anything that you don't recognize. And we're going to try to delete those along the way if there's anything that we don't want up on this feed. So I want to introduce you to Julie. Julie is a recognized and award-winning women's rights advocate and public educator who's based in Ottawa. She works with various feminist organizations that are dedicated to ending sexual violence, engaging bystanders, and building communities, communities of support. She's frequently called on by the media to share her expertise on the issue of violence against women. Earlier this year, Julie published a book, Resilience is Futile, the life and death and life of Julie Esselon, and she shares her own story of dealing with an abusive relationship. After leaving her partner at age 20, she was stalked for 10 years by him, living in fear and wondering where she would be and where he would be, where he would show up next. 
The book delves into how she navigated this experience while doing her advocacy work at the same time and looks at how we deal as a society with trauma and resilience. What I found so powerful is that she addressed the double bind of resilience. We see resilience as a really positive thing. We expect people to be resilient. And for me, I want to know how we're going to support people to be resilient and why are we putting it on individuals who experience this violence to be resilient. Our community should be safe for people regardless of where they're at and regardless of who they are. So we're gonna talk about that with her. And of course, you can buy this book wherever books are sold. We want to encourage you, of course, to support your local bookstore, indie bookstore, and also recognize that uh, between the lines, the, the publisher of this book has a 30% sale happening right now. So you can go to the website, btlbooks.com, and find it there. And this is a really great small press that we should support. So please go ahead and, and do that. And recognize that you can get it in ebook format, you can get it in book format, and you can get it in audio format. So I'm going to bring Julie in. Hi, Julie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. I'm happy to have you. And so we will have the first question we want to launch into. It must have been a real challenge to visit these experiences in your memoir. You speak very frankly about your experiences. Can you talk a bit about your journey towards writing this book? I, as you said, I have been working to end violence against women and girls in Canada for almost 20 years now. And in that time, I really built up a profile and I'm quite privileged that I have, you know, I tweet about things and it gets picked up by the media. And so when my stalker died, which is when my, the stalking ended is when he died suddenly in an accident, I took to Twitter and I wanted to share this secret that I had been holding on to for quite some time. And I was approached to write an article and then I was approached to write a book. And I said, no, I really pushed back on the idea of writing a book because I knew it would be really, really hard. And it was really, really hard. And I wanna give a huge shout out to the BAM Center for the Arts um, in Alberta, where I was able to go. And truthfully, if I didn't have a retreat to go to in the mountains for two weeks, um, I don't think I would have been able to, to write the book or I don't think I would have been able to write it as authentically as I did. And I also hesitated to write the book because people want a very specific narrative from survivors. They want a very specific story of something horrible happened to me. And then, you know, I found Jesus, I got sober, I did this, and now I'm thriving, I'm doing well. And, you know, if this didn't happen to me, I wouldn't be where I am today. And that's not how I frame my experience at all. And publishers were very reticent to publish a book that went into the complexity of trauma. Um, I'm glad I wrote my book, but it was certainly a heck of a journey to get there. Well, I wanna thank you for writing this book. I was really taken by the fact that you were speaking to how conflicted somebody is in these situations. And that, as you said, is not a narrative that we tend to see very often. And many times, this is the very thing that we judge people for. Um, so many thanks for you for being as honest as, it, as you were. And really, this is emotional labor that you've taken on as a writer, and I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad because, yeah, I, I, it is, it's a lot of work and, and people, people really overestimated how cathartic it would be for me. I got a lot of, you know, when I was doing press about it, a lot of like, oh God, how good did it feel to write this book? And I was like, it was hell. <laughs> it cost me, I went to so much therapy. It cost me so much money. Um, mm. it, you know, it's not something you can just do on the side of your desk. Um, you have to be in it and to be in it and to make it authentic. It means you got to go, you know, all the way. Um, and then you can't just dip back out and be like, okay, I'm gonna go do some, you know, write up a report now, right? Like it's a lot of energy. Um, and it was important for me that it be authentic because I think not all survivor stories being put out into the world are actually move the conversation forward. I think we have to be really strategic um, with how we tell our stories because otherwise I think it turns into, you know, trauma porn. I think it reinforces really negative stereotypes about victims. And I think it sets other victims up to fail because they think, holy smokes, like, look at her, she's thriving. What's my problem? Why can't I can't, you know, how come I can't get out of bed in the morning, let alone tell my story on the news? Um, so tell us a bit about what you hoped people would take away. There's lots of things in there that you just mentioned there, but what's like the number one thing that comes to your mind? You're hoping people are just gonna read this and be like, yes, top of mind. 
Uh, it's what you said at the top about the complexity of resilience. It's really, really, really important for me that people complicate that conversation. My book came out the day the pandemic was declared, which like I don't recommend <laughs> as a book <laughs> launch strategy. It, you know, my book tour was canceled. Um, you know, a bunch of the media I had to promote the book was canceled. Like it was bananas. Um, but what's been interesting is that in the context of the pandemic, the term resilient has come up so often. I mean, it was literally the name of the speech from the throne that happened this fall, right? It was about resilient, building a resilient Canada. And, you know, our sector, the violence against women sector, it's a term we use a lot. Uh, and so it was important for me to challenge it on, you know, to my colleagues and at a systemic level, but also for individuals to really think about the, what I refer to as the double bind of resilience that particularly impacts women, which is, you have to fake being well enough to be taken seriously, to be seen as a reliable narrator, to be seen as someone who you know, has the authority to speak about their experience. But if you do that too well, then people dismiss your pain because they think, well, you're fine. Like you're doing okay. And I lived that intimately because I was seen as this person who was challenging the Canadian Armed Forces, challenging universities, fearless. And then I came forward to say, actually, I lived in absolute terror for 10 years and people thought you're either exaggerating or like it clearly wasn't that bad because like you're thriving. So what do you have to complain about? Um, and so you have to you like walk this delicate balance and it's not fair. <laughs> and it's more complicated if you're a person of color, if you're disabled. I mean, folks with disabilities talk all the time about the idea of like being seen as like inspiration for able-bodied people and like all of this nonsense is like, okay, but I can't talk about, you know, how much it sucks that we live in an ableist society because people want me to be a beacon of hope for other people. And fundamentally to me, when we focus so much on resilience, I know we're trying to be positive. Like I, I know we're trying to give survivors hope, but ultimately we're glamorizing suffering, right? We're making it seem, we're perpetuating the idea that suffering builds character, suffering builds tenacity and grit and, every day I wake up trying to end the suffering in, in the world, right? I'm trying to end suffering for women and girls. And so it's, you know, doesn't make sense. It's hypocritical of me to be like, but look at where it got you today. It's like, well, also you're de denying me the empathy that I had, you know, the idea that people have to suffer greatly in order to be kind and generous to other people is a myth. Um, and I, it's important for us to really challenge that. Um, I'm feeling everything you're saying so hard right now. I can't, uh, I can't process it. Um, I really want to hear your thoughts about if we were to stop glamorizing um, and allow room for diversity of resilience, perhaps diversity of responses, even not even resilience, just responses to violence. What would that look like to you? Give us a sense. Well, I would tell folks to pick up Soraya Chamali's Rage Becomes Her because she gives you a book that is chock-a-block full of research and analysis to prove that even in utero, you know, if your parents found out that you were female in the womb, people right away start treating you differently because we have such gendered expectations of how girls and women should behave. And one of those is you can't be angry. Um, and the reason why anger is such a powerful emotion is that it's a sense of injustice. If I'm angry, it's because I feel like I was wronged and I want justice. If I'm sad, it's a retreating emotion. It's a, you know, it's my fault. I did something. I kind of sit in my feelings and there's no room for anger, right? Anger, women's anger in particular, again, especially if you're a woman of color, scares the bejesus out of the patriarchy. And so we try to quell it as much as possible. I was angry and I still am angry that I was stalked for 10 years, that he was enabled by the people around him, that the police didn't care. I was angry that the violence against women sector doesn't talk about stalking and that I had to tell my story in order to start that conversation. Like I had a lot of anger and people didn't want it, right? That there was no space for it. People wanted me to just be grateful that I survived, grateful that he's dead now and it's over. And that, that emphasis on gratitude was really, don't make us uncomfortable. Just let us tie this up into a neat bow because that makes us feel safer. And so I want room for righteous rage because righteous rage is what fueled me for 10 years to do the work I did to end violence against women. Anger can be a super positive emotion and we don't create space for it, especially um, for victims of crime who are women and girls. Um, here, here in terms of just making space for anger, making space for us to be uncomfortable and sit in that discomfort just a bit so that we can get to a place perhaps where we can 
change the world. I mean, I don't know what else changes the world except anger and that pressure to, to move and change. So I want to speak a little bit about this piece around stalking. You mentioned that the violence against women sector, the gender-based violence sector, and all kinds of sectors, like we don't have a conceptualization, conceptualization of stalking necessarily that is always true to form, true to what people are experiencing. And sometimes it's one of these things that I myself um, really am learning about every day. Um, I want to talk about the fact that you worked with an a animation studio uh, a few years ago now with a really powerful video called Out of the Shadows. It's about stalking. It's focused on those who are experiencing it. And I think that it's very powerful, particularly for younger women who might be experiencing it in like a dating violence relationship or when those things break down. Um, and I just like to show a clip and let's just get into some topics around that. So sit tight folks, I'm just gonna remove us and show you a clip. Hi, my name is Julie, and when I was 18, I had a really crappy boyfriend. It took me two years and two tries, but I eventually left him. We tell women to leave and to stay gone, but we don't talk about what can happen next. I thought leaving him would keep me safe, but things immediately got worse. He banged on the doors of anyone who had ever known me, demanding to know where I was. I had to be moved from place to place in order to avoid being found. I eventually called him from a payphone, begging him to calm down. He later left a note on my car detailing where he had seen me that week and telling me the exact payphone I had called him from. He harassed me, my coworkers, my roommates, my family, my friends. He sent me dead flowers, called me dozens of times a day, and alternated between sending me love poems and sending me suicide notes, telling me he'd kill himself and it would be all my fault. Every time I moved, he'd find out where I lived and I'd have to move again. People told me it was a coincidence. People told me he was just heartbroken. People told me his flowers and notes were grand gestures meant to get me back. You should be flattered. He stalked me for over a decade. In Um, so just a little teaser, folks, for you. If you want to see the full thing, you can definitely do that on YouTube. It's available for you. And of course, shout out to Ambivalently Yours, who worked on this video with uh, some beautiful animation. It's available in English and French, and it has a downloadable poster as well, too. Um, and you can check out Ambivalently Yours online and on Instagram. She sells lots of funny, feminist swag. And keep that in mind for your holiday gift list. That's it. Um, this video really had a lot of important messages and one of the painful truths that you mentioned, we tell women to leave and stay gone, but then we don't talk about what will happen next. So from your point of view, what do we need to better support women and gender diverse people to leave and stay gone? It's really just being blunt about the risk. We live in a culture in which still it's 2020 and we're still dropping all of these cliched bombs about, you know, why didn't you leave? And why did you go back? And, and we don't, we have not been, you know, had a widespread conversation about what we know in our sector, which is women leaving situations of violence are the most at risk of being killed in the moments that they leave and the months after that. Right? So it's a very, very dangerous time and we don't have frank conversations about that. And so I, like so many women, thought the second I walked out that door, it was done and that the hardest part was over. And it wasn't. Um, you know, Dating an abuser for two years was absolutely nothing compared to being stalked by him for 10 years. And I was woefully unprepared. And I had already been doing this work. Like I was a women's studies major in university. Like I wasn't naive to how flawed the system is and I still felt completely blindsided um, by the acute level of stalking that I experienced and so we really need to talk about that piece and I think part of the reason why we haven't is because then we would have to talk about the systemic failures and instead we like to just responsibilize women and say you got to leave 
you got to leave, you got to leave. And then we, then, then, then it's like, okay, you, you did the right thing because you left. Um, and so we need to have a frank conversation about what to do afterwards in a practical way. Um, thank you for that. I think uh, you just nailed it when you talked about we would have to get into some of the details around the system that it's just not set up the way it should be. Um, so I'm curious for people who don't decide to leave, actually decide that it's safer to stay. And in many cases, that could be true. What do we need to do to better support survivors when they need to stay to say stay? I would tell you to do like my dear friend Taylor. So when I told her that I was thinking of leaving Xavier, who was my ex, she was also, I think not even 20. So she was like 19 at the time, was also a student, was as ill prepared as I was. And I remember her looking at me and saying, okay, okay. And if you don't, if you, if you can't do it tonight, if it's too scary, it's okay. You can try again later. And so when I went home, and I get verklempt just thinking about that story every time because it was such a powerful moment in my life. And it was a 30 second conversation that she said flippantly. And I brought it up to her when the book came out and she was like, I don't even remember saying that. Um, but it was hugely important to me because when I went home and I tried to leave him and I got into such a panic attack that I was literally throwing up and I couldn't breathe and I was so scared and I decided it was safer to stay. I knew I could call Taylor and tell her and that she wouldn't be disappointed in me. She would know that I just needed some more time and I just needed someone to support me in the situation that I was in, even though we both knew it was not a healthy situation. And so often people think they need to give their friends some tough love and really kind of this metaphorical, you know, like you see in black and white movies where women are like, ah, they're hysterical and someone kind of slaps them in the face, like snap out of it. People do that in a metaphorical sense, right? Of like, what are you doing? smarter than this I thought you were a feminist why do you let him talk to you like that like they think that they're kind of like slapping some sense into somebody but you're shaming them and so it forces people to isolate even further instead of saying look when you're ready we can walk through that door together that's what we need to be telling women okay I really appreciate this a lot um I feel that I and many people that I know have been guilty of that slap metaphorical slapping get step out of it yeah. Tell us a little bit more. Um, to be a ju non judgmental support, what does that yeah. look like? So, I really encourage people to memorize I see, I feel. I see, I feel. So, my father, and he, and now I have his permission to share the story. My father was one of those people who was like, Girl, I raised you better than this. Like, I didn't raise you to tolerate this nonsense. He grew up in a home where he saw his mother get beaten every single day. So, he drove into my head the importance of a healthy relationship. And I still found myself in an unhealthy relationship. And so he came at it from this like, girl, I didn't raise you to tolerate this. Nah, nah, nah. What instead, what he should have said, and he now recognizes is, I see that your personality has changed. I see that you are very defensive of him. I see that you are very na na na. And it makes me feel scared for you. It makes me feel worried. It makes me feel concerned. And I just want you to know that. I see, I feel. You're starting from your perspective. You're just opening up a door. You're not bringing judgment to the conversation. You're not providing them with some ultimatum of like, you either leave him or I can't be friends with you. Like any of that stuff that is not helpful. <laughs> it's so important to just start from your perspective. I'm coming from a place of concern, not judgment. I'm not disappointed in you. I'm worried. Um, and I want to know what I can do to support you. I see, I feel. And I mean, you can pick that up and use that for, you know, if someone's in a mental health crisis, if someone is dealing, struggling in some way to just start from, I see, I feel is an empathetic way that puts it from your perspective instead of the whole world is questioning your poor decision. So explain yourself, uh, which again, your intent might be supportive, but the impact of that is shame, 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 which survivors are already dealing with enough. So enough with the shame and the humiliation. Um, so I see, I feel you're starting with I statements and this idea of intent versus impact, really, really key. Um, tell us a little bit more about that intent versus impact, because lots of us are well-intended, but we know the road to hell can be paved with good intentions. Tell us a bit about that. Totally. So as a public educator, for, you know, for example, one of the huge reasons why I focus on bystander intervention is that I know that the vast majority of us are witnessing and hearing violence and it's unjust, unfair, and super naive to assume that, you know, the police are just going to deal with it. So I don't have a role to play. Um, 
But oftentimes people then get defensive when we talk about bison or intervention because they don't want to name the fact that, yeah, but I, I meant well. And they get really stuck on this, like, but I meant well. Um, and even in the context of you know sexual harassment, racism, homophobia, I was just joking. I didn't mean to offend. I didn't know that expression was racist. I didn't know, I didn't know. And again, like your intent matters when it comes to the consequences of your actions, because I do think we should differentiate between someone who's intentionally hurtful and someone who you know, didn't intend to be hurtful. But in that moment, the impact is all that matters, right? And the example I give all the time is like, if I were to run over someone's dog by accident, I could spend all day talking about how your dog ran into the road and I didn't see them. And then, but your dog is still dead, you know? And so we have to address the fact that you are grieving and then we can talk about whether or not I should be, you know, charged for reckless driving or not, right? But in the moment, what's important is the harm that was caused. And we just get so caught up in, don't think I'm a bad person, I meant well. And I think part of that is that we have to have these frank conversations about accountability and what we want from people who cause harm, whether intentional or unintentional, um, and really focus on harm was caused, whether it violated a policy, whether it violated the law, harm was caused, and that should be our forefront concern. Focus on the harm. Um, okay, let's go to this pandemic uh, that nobody wants to talk about, but is in everybody's <laughs> minds. Um, we have heard over and over again, people sounding the alarm that there's an increased, increased risk of abuse, increased risk, particularly of gender-based violence. Tell us what your concern is right now when it comes to the pandemic's impact on gender-based violence. And I'm particularly thinking around stalking, how that might play out now in this context. It's very easy to stalk somebody right now because chances are they're not going very far. And if they are, they're going to the same two or three places. It's very difficult um, to escape inundated messages. It's very difficult to tell someone to just log off right now. We exist online in 2020. That's how we are surviving this pandemic. It's how we're going to class. It's how we're going to school. It's how we're connecting with each other. So technology we knew pre-COVID was hugely, uh, you know, was being used to facilitate gender-based violence and stalking in particular in a big bad way. Uh, but now it's, I think it's just been cranked up in terms of the volume because people are easy to find and people are very online. Uh, and so that makes it easy to inundate their social media accounts, their inbox, to text them incessantly um, because, you know, they know you're at home at a desk in front of your computer or, you know, if, you, if you're working, you're going to work and coming home. Um, so I'm really concerned about um, victims of stalking right now. And speaking from my own experience, stalking is incredibly isolating. It's incredibly scary. And that was, you know, when it was actually harder to do pre uh, COVID. And so it's really important for me to, to talk about it, especially because the nature of stalking, we're not, we're never going to have a me too moment around stalking ever, because by definition, when you talk about stalking, it makes it worse because your stalker is just dying for you to acknowledge that they're getting to you. They are dying to know that their messages are getting through, that they're having an impact. And so when you talk about your experience of stalking, unless he's dead or in jail, chances are it's gonna make it worse. Um, and so people are already feeling that level of, I can't talk about it. And then this sense of, you know, well, everyone's going through something right now. And so like, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk about my problems. And it's just exacerbating people's feelings of just being, alone in the world. And again, like I said, with stalking, we don't talk about it. So people already feel like they're the only person in the world that it's happening to. The digital element of stalking, I think your book really gets into it. And this was a while back. So of course now texting is not 10 cents a text. <laughs> it's yeah. happening all the time, WhatsApp, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah. So that's a very important point in this pandemic context in particular, when our digital life has become our real life. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, my stalker traced a payphone in 2005, which in speaking to police now as like a grown ass woman who has contacts with police, they're like, I cannot tell you how difficult that is to do. And it was incredibly difficult to do in 2005. So this is somebody who, you know, had a high school education, was just very interested in IT and tech um, and figured out a way to do this. And that was, you know, like you said, flip phones, no texting. Now there's GPS in everyone's phone. People have these home security systems that are super easy to, to talk, you know, 
You have your GPS to have Uber come to your house. Well, you don't know Uber now has your information. Like it's just so easy to leave a footprint of crumbs for someone to find you. And I suffered greatly and it ended in 2015 when technology was, you know, not nearly as advanced as it is today. So my heart breaks for people who are living that right now because it's, it's unimaginable to me. The book also really speaks about this experience of being young. Um, and one of the things that we did was review a book um, or read a book called They Said This Would Be Fun. It was a memoir by Trinity Martis. And she talks about all kinds of powerful things, but in particular, being in an abusive relationship in high school and moving into university, there's a lot of parallels, I think, with your book. Um, she expressed a real support gap for young women in abusive dating relationships. Can you tell us what needs to happen? What needs to be in place for young women who might be going through this? It's a very under-recognized form of gender-based violence. What it means to be young, not married, and experiencing this violence. Absolutely. It's why, you know, people in our sector refer to it as intimate partner violence, and we've really moved away from domestic violence. And if you're watching this, I really encourage you to do the same because it's important to talk about that it's the intimacy of the relationship that causes the harm. It's not necessarily the, you know, legal paperwork of being married or even living in the same home. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I agree with Eternity in a big way. Like we don't talk about dating violence for young people. We talk about sexual assault in the context of young people. And we talk about domestic violence in the context of older folks. And we don't talk about sexual assault against elders. And we don't talk about the fact that young people experience incredibly high levels of intimate partner violence that are not recognized, that are not talked about. And you know, you live with your parents, you're not gonna go to a shelter. That's not what you're looking for. But again, the sort of common narrative in this country is domestic violence, you go to a shelter, sexual assault, you call a support line, right? And we don't talk about, I'm not looking for housing. I'm looking for support. I'm looking for assistance. I'm looking for therapy. I'm looking to talk to someone. And I'm also trying to understand, is this even what an abusive relationship looks like, right? We still have such cliched understandings of what intimate partner violence looks like. Like we're still seeing stock photos of black eyes and women with their heads down and, you know, all of these really cliched stuff that, that makes people think, well, you didn't hit me. You know, and for years, I, I was actually doing an interview with the BBC this summer and I re they stopped me in my tracks because I said, you know, Xavier was sexually abusive. He was financially abusive. He was emotionally, psychologically abusive, but not physically abusive. And they were like, well, he sexually assaulted you. That's that's physical abuse. And I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I guess it kind of is. But again, because I was like, well, he never punched me and he was smaller than I was. And so I would, in my mind, play out this idea that like, girl, you could take, you could beat his ass if you tried. Um, and I didn't try. And so then I was like, well, clearly he wasn't that abusive because I did like all of these complicated ideas because we don't talk about psychological torture by someone who claims to care about you. We don't talk about the cycle of, of abuse. We don't talk about you know, how these people start off really lovely. And there's a reason why we fall for them. Like we don't talk about coercion. My God, the number one thing that I do in my work with young women is talk about coercion because that's all they want to talk about. They want to talk about guilt tripping. My God, I mean, that was my Achilles heel. I just wanted to please. I am, I'm, I've had to fight my instincts as a people pleaser. Like I'm such a people pleaser. And so are so many young women. Like that's how we're socialized. And so he would tell me that what I was doing would make him feel bad. And then I would capitulate because I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want you to feel bad. You know, and it was only when I was out of the situation that I realized that dude was manipulating me. Like, he didn't actually feel bad. He just knew what to poke to get me to acquiesce. And we don't talk about those things. And so it's a very confusing time to be a young woman in the world because you're realizing you have no power. Um, and then you add in, like, a major gap in resources where you don't see your experience reflected elsewhere and you think he just has bad days or I'm not a good enough partner and that's why things don't feel right. And we gotta change that. Um, I really am so mindful of the fact that stories like yours, um, so many other people as well too, stories is what has helped us even understand that gender-based violence is a thing. Um, many, many years have gone where there was no recognition, as you said, if it was not outright slapping, punching, it would not be seen as a real issue that anybody needed to take up. And the reason why and we're talking about things now, the reason why there's a Me Too movement is because survivors are the voices that have come forward and spoken about their unique 
perspectives, survivors and the people who support them and who raise their voices as well too. So I'm really mindful of that. So I want to switch to asking you about the invaluable books, stories, films, articles that you think are must reads right now for people to understand just what gender-based violence is for both young people and adult people as well too. And let's talk about women who are older as well too. You really stress that point so strongly in your book. Well, um, the book that completely and totally changed my life that came out the fall that my abuser died, um, I actually don't have with me because I lent it to my friend and I've lent it to like 40 people now. Um, it's called Irritable Hearts, a PTSD love story. Um, and it's by someone, the title of the book, the author's name is Mac McClellan on the book, but they now go by Gabriel Mac. Um, it's a very powerful look at what trauma does to you, which was really key for me to understand that I had the right to feel as crappy as I did because I did in fact suffer greatly. So Irritable Hearts, a PTSD love story, cannot recommend it enough. Also possibly one of the best books I've read in my entire life is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. She only has two books, which I think is like rude um, because she's so good that I'm like, please just make more books. Um, but this is her really creative, complicated, artistic memoir about being in a violent relationship with another woman and what it was like to be a queer woman in an abusive relationship with another woman. Um, it's so powerful. And what I love about it is it's messy. And it just really names the fact that like people want clean endings and that's not what reality is. It really names the fact that you love this person and you just want them to get better and you don't understand why your love isn't enough to change them. Whew, it is phenomenal. I found it so helpful as a survivor, but also as a, yeah, just in terms of healing, like thinking about it, like it's okay if, if your shit's messy. It's okay if you don't really know how to categorize things. It's okay if you look at the same experience through three different perspectives. Um, cannot recommend it enough. So, so, so good. Um, and I think if you're reflecting on being a young woman under patriarchy, or you are a young woman under patriarchy, um, Rebecca Solnit, who many people know as the woman who wrote the book, Men Explain Things to Me, which is what brought about the term mansplaining. Uh, Rebecca Solnit is, she's literally on my vision board. So is Carmen as like the two writers I want to be when I grow up. Like, phenomenal but what I love about her book recollections of my non-existence is she's kind of skirts around the issues of like sexual violence and and sexual harassment but she really talks about how it forms you as a young woman to live in a world where you're constantly under threat but we're not supposed to talk about it um and how it informed her writing how it informed her life choices um and just how you feel unbelievably powerless and yet your body is up for critique and discussion every single day when you leave your house. Um, and En Francais, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm so far really loving Le Consentement, which is also uh, a memoir that just came out uh, about a woman talk, reflecting on her experience of being a young woman um, who was always hit on and loved by older men, which is a thing that we just do not talk enough about. We talk a lot about the creepers who hit on young women, but we don't talk about it from the perspective of a young woman and how confusing it is um, because it feels nice. It feels nice when older men pay attention to us and there's power in that. And we shame women for acting on that instead of talking about why it is that you're attracted to that situation because, oh wait, we live in a world in which you have no power and this pr and proximity to men is proximity to power. So those kinds of conversations I find really helpful for me to think of my own experience. Um, and I love that they are not giving neat endings. I don't do neat endings because that's not how I live my life. <laughs> Girl, nobody, nobody. <laughs> I think if we think we do, we're we're going to get really disappointed. Any other books that, or movies or films or any other content that you would recommend, um, particularly for folks who might be just dealing with a violent relationship or a violent situation right now, and they're just trying to process it, thinking about what their next steps might be? Uh, I'm really picky when it comes to fiction about it because I find, and I'm sure you can agree, that oftentimes it's like really gratuitous. 
um, or just really, yeah, it feels exploitive and or again, they're all about like, but it's okay because she's better now. Uh, but I May Destroy You destroyed me in all the best ways. Um, it's on Crave if you are, um, if you have Crave, I highly recommend you watch it. They're 30 minutes and you will not be able to crush it in one sitting because it's heavy. But Michaela Cohen's wrote about her own experience of sexual assault and it was a drug facilitated sexual assault. So she has rec you know, very few recollections of what actually happened. And it's a really, it's fictionalized based on her true story, but it's fictionalized. Um, but it's such a powerful examination of the self doubt that you have, uh, you know, your idea of whether or not you even have the right to be upset about things because, you know, it wasn't that bad. And, all of these kinds and what trauma does to you and what people expect of you. It's like, it's so powerful. It's beautifully shot. All of the acting is phenomenal. And the soundtrack is pure fire, which also helps. Um, but I, I was so moved by that. And to be honest, I haven't been moved by depictions or discussions of sexual violence in uh, fiction in a really long time, because I'm just really sick of it um as like a plot point of like she had grit because she was raped as a child like i'm just like oh i'm so over it um so i was really reticent to watch it but i cannot say enough great things about i may destroy you um so powerful really glad that you mentioned that one um boy that is a powerful uh, piece and it particularly shows voices that are not heard, what their experiences are in terms of gender-based violence, the fact that it was drug facilitated violence, um, you know, a real underspoken piece um, and also what different people in different identities, different bodies, different experiences, what violence might look like to them and how they have to negotiate it. And it's really complicated. I want to get your sense on other voices and perspectives you would like to hear more from in terms of our understanding of gender-based violence to make progress, learning from survivor stories. I want a show about stalking from the perspective of the victim and no more goddamn you and like all of these Netflixy type shows where it's like we're getting insight into the mind of a stalker. It's like we don't need insight into the mind of a stalker. We know what their motivations are. We've studied it indefinitely. Let's talk about the impact. Um, I have not seen a depiction of stalking in pop culture in any way, shape or form that honestly rang true to me at all. Um, it's either hyper, hyper sensual, uh, sensationalized or what the media loves in particular is men being stalked by hot women. Like that's a trope that we see is like if a woman is a stalker, it's because she's hot, but crazy, but like it's kind of hot because she's crazy. Like it's a weird situation. And so I would love, love, love to see that. I would love to see conversation around stalking again from the perspective of those impacted. And the feminist gerontologist in me would also love to see intimate partner violence, sexual assault, um, happening to older folks. It, we know what's happening. Um, and I think COVID-19 has exposed the deep, deep rooted ageism in our culture. Um, and we're, we don't value the lives of older folks. Um, older women are not only one of the poorest demographics in Canada, but thanks to the work of the Canadian Femicide Observatory, we also know that they're the, the demographic that is experiencing the highest rates of, of femicide, right? That like they are overrepresented in our statistics around femicide. Um, and that's shocking, right? Like why is it that women over 55 are being killed by their partners at increasing rates? And yet when we talk about domestic violence, we're still talking about, you know, people in their thirties, for example. Um, so I would really love to see the experiences that older folks experience talked about, shown, um, and the fact that like we can point to Grace and Frankie and the Golden Girls as like the only examples of older people, older women living in society tells me that we haven't had that conversation and yet we should, right? Like Canada's an aging population um, and to age is a privilege, right? The alternative is that we die young. Um, and so we need to talk about this, the cycle of violence throughout the whole lifespan. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and no disrespect to the Golden Girls. I love the Golden Girls, but I think you're so right that those real stories of lifetime abuse and then how that plays out when you're an older person um, needs to be spoken about. And yes, the pandemic has showed us that older women are also at higher risk of, of dying of this disease, getting it and dying. Um, so add to that all the pandemics within the pandemics. I think that comes to light again. 
I, I swear we could talk to you for all night, but we want to be respectful of your time. But I do want to get to just a couple of the questions that folks have put um, in the question chat box, because I think it's incredible. Um, somebody said, how do we check on friends and family at risk in these pandemic times? We don't see each other in person, obviously. So what do we do when we can't check on them regularly in person? Well, I would encourage you to foster the kinds of relationships where you feel like you can have some semblance of real talk, where it's normal to check in and ask people how they're doing and hope, you know, and expect a sincere answer. I would also say, excuse me, it's a great opportunity to plug the Canadian Women's Foundation signal for help. <laughs> um, so take the, you know, take that information, post it on all of your social media, make sure that you know, the friends in particular that you're thinking of receive it and just frame it as like, did you see this? I thought this was so interesting, but it only works if people know about it. So if you could please spread the word. Um, and that's, again, a great way to encourage people to be able to communicate and ask for help when it's not safe for them to do so, right? If I live with my abuser, I'm not going to be frank with people on the phone or over Skype how I'm doing. I also probably can't access therapy from home, um, you know, which is the thing that a lot of people might have been on the path of healing, might have been working themselves up to be able to leave that relationship. And now they're stuck at home with them. They can't see their therapist. They can't be honest with their therapist. So they're really struggling. Um, so I think fostering and normalizing check-ins and then to teaching people to call for help, uh, I think are really concrete things we can do. Um, so yeah, that signal for help. I uh, just want to make sure I do it again. Uh, and we'll show you a little video at the very end that explains a little bit more about that. I have another question about bystanders. Somebody's asking, how do you teach bystanders how to speak about male violence against women? Great question. I, it is an excellent question. And it's what I spend the bulk of my life doing because it's life-changing work. Uh, I would say the primary thing to keep in mind is that violating someone's consent in order to make a point that violating consent is wrong doesn't make sense. So you need the permission, the consent, and the okay from the person you're trying to help before you take action. Um, so for example, if someone is over the age of 18, you do not and should not call the police if they tell you that they've been sexually assaulted. Um, you might think, oh, I'm doing this person a solid, they're just not brave enough to do it and I can. Actually, no, that person you know, may or may not know that they can call police, but you certainly shouldn't call police on their behalf. So really just checking in with people and letting them lead and recognizing they are the experts in their own lives. I am an educated, able-bodied white woman. I can't go around the country and tell people what to do to prevent violence or what they, to do to respond to violence and just give them an answer based on my perspective. Um, because I have a ton of privilege, right? And so for me to go to, you know, Chigging First Nation and say like, you know, we got to start like calling out the creepers and we got to start reporting this stuff. They'd be like, yeah, okay, cool. But that literally makes no sense in my context, right? So it's really, really important that you let the person who's been victimized, let them lead and just say, I am here to walk the path with you. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you what not to do. I'm just here to stand beside you while you make decisions. And if you're trying to figure out what your options are, I can Google that. I can come back to you with that information but I'm not going to take over because it's not my life and I'm not the expert in your life. You are the expert in your own life. We all are, right? We all know um, what does and does not make sense for us. So let the person lead, whether it's a complete stranger that you're trying to help being creeped on on the bus or your friend trying to leave a situation of violence, let them lead always. How important that is because many of us, uh people pleasers like me, and I'm told that you as well too, from your very mouth, um, that we tend to also want to take over because we want to solve things. And this is the problem. When we're solving things for other people, what we're doing is taking away their agency. So it's better to be like, I'll be with you. As you said, walk the path. I'll be here. It's going to be messy. It's going to be tough, but like, I'll hang tight you take the lead and let that person get that sense of control. I think that's such a powerful thing. And so often we don't do that because we think the kind thing is to take over. This is a very good cool. message. 
So, okay, Julie, it's already 519. We're not going to steal more of your time, but I just want to thank you for joining us and sharing all these incredible resources. Uh, you are just such a strong voice in terms of just your stuff. You know your stuff. Plus, you also share your experience very openly and freely. I want to thank you again for that emotional labor that you take on. And I want to thank you for this book. And I think, thank, you. thank you very much for joining us and sharing us all, with all this, all these resources and books. Um, I don't know, maybe what we can do is get uh, that list of the books that you uh, mm -hmm. named for us and we can just post it in our Facebook to make sure that people have access to that. Wonderful. And yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and creating and holding space for this icky, complicated conversation. And yeah, the again, my book is available audiobook, so and it's narrated by me. So if you want me to tell you my story, um, I can do that for you. Uh, you can download it on Audible wherever you get it, um, or yeah, in paperback uh, or an ebook. And also to let folks know that it's as you know, it's a very short book, and it was intentionally very short. I didn't, I don't, I don't make you sit in the heavy for too long. I promise you, <laughs> I make my point and then I move on. Um, but yeah, if you've got big feelings about it, I'm here for it. And I always love hearing from folks. So um, please feel free if this is something you're interested in or work that you want to get involved in or activism that you want to be a part of. Um, I'm happy to connect you to all the right folks. But yeah, huge thank you to Canadian Women's Foundation. Y'all are great. You're fab. So thank you for everything you do. Ah, you're fab. And by the way, 30% off from your publisher, BTL, yes. between the line, right? Yes. Yes, we want for, to the sure yes. for the and holidays. Yeah, for the holidays. For the holidays, they're doing a thirty percent off sale off some of their books, um, and they have excuse me, <clears throat> incredible books um, on like you know what does it mean to be to create a city that's safe for women, like infrastructure. Like there's just so much cool stuff that BTL is doing. So I encourage you to say no to the big box stores, but if you live in a rural community where your only option is to order from Amazon or Chapters, it is available there as well. Thanks, Julie. Have a great rest of the night. Thank you so much. So folks, um, I, I hope that you will take the opportunity to get this book. I think it's just a fantastic read, um, harrowing and sometimes difficult read, but also a beautiful sense of humor, great writ great uh, just narrative style. Um, I think Julie is just such a, a entertaining person uh, in and of herself, so I don't uh, think you will be disappointed at all. And I just want to highlight a couple of upcoming events. As you know, we mentioned we're in the thick of the Act Together campaign. There's things that you can do every day up until December the 10th, the end of the 16 days of activism. And you can go to CanadianWomen.org to get more detail about it. But of course, there are things like critical thinking cards you can access, December 6th memorial video that you can take a look at and also share on your channels, and also our podcast. Um, we're really excited about just all the things that people can do over this period. And because we can't be in person, of course, that has its limitations. So we want to encourage you to use your digital channels if you have access to that and share. And even if you don't have access to too many digital tools, you can always speak to one or two people in your life um, about these issues just to get that conversation going. And uh, many thanks to you folks who have been involved in doing things and sharing it online. We're so thankful to you. We're also thankful for all the folks who have donated to our Out of Violence Fund. We're really focused on that in the next few weeks um, until the end of December. We're going to be fundraising for our Out of Violence programs. And the thing that's so powerful about Out of Violence is that we're looking at prevention. We're looking at intervention as well, too. So stopping the violence before it starts, but then also supporting people when they experience violence. And there's also an element of that fund that really focuses on building the sector and building the systemic response. We are kidding ourselves if we're thinking that this widespread violence is going to ever end if we just deal with it on an individual level or a relationship level or a home level. We got to get to communities. We got to get to policies and practices. We have to actually change the way we think about this violence, our attitudes and behaviors. And this kind of stuff comes from when women's organizations and groups addressing gender-based violence come together and come up with best practices. There's very little support and funding for this in the world. So this Out of Violence Fund is so special and unique. If you would like to give to that, go to our website, CanadianWomen.org, and you will find information about that. Please give if you can in this holiday season. It's a great time to give. And we know that violence right now has a higher risk of happening in the pandemic context and also in the holidays context. 
that really is just a double whammy in terms of pressures and stress on people. Finally, I want to share with you a little video clip about the signal for help. As Julie had mentioned, that the signal for help is something we've been promoting. It's just a simple signal, one-handed, that you can do on a video call that it enables you to be able to say, I need support um, without actually vocalizing it and without leaving a digital trace. As we're using video tools much more often, this may be helpful to some people some of the time. There's no one size fits all approach, but we want to encourage you to at least know um, what the signal is and how to respond. You can go to our website to find more information, just some tips about what you can do if you see this in a video call. And I just encourage you, if you can share it with people in your lives, it can be a really valuable tool to help folks right now at this tough time. So many thanks for joining us. And I hope that you enjoyed this beautiful session with Julie. And here's a signal for help video. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Can you share that banana bread recipe? Sure. It's, it's actually my mom's banana bread recipe, but it's, uh, it's pretty foolproof and super easy. Well, I really appreciate it. I know your mom's a great baker, so should be good.